Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here. In this video, I'm going to talk about the six most common elements uh, found in life, uh, Chons plus P. I will also show you guys models of those using Bohr models and Lewis dot structures. We will have a discussion of bonding, which will include covalent bonding and ionic bonding, as well as the intermolecular forces of hydrogen bonding. And then lastly, we'll get into the idea of radioactive isotopes and some applications of radioactive isotopes in biology and in medicine. So here's a diagram of the periodic table, and so you can see all of the different elements that are found on the periodic table. And when you take chemistry, you'll go into a much deeper dive into how this is organized and all, all of the uh, different properties of the different uh, families of elements. But in biology, for the most part, we're going to talk about six elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. These are the six elements that are used to make up macromolecules. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are found in the four major macromolecules. Nitrogen is found in two of the four, and then phosphorus is found in one and sulfur is found in the other. So as we get into macromolecules, these six elements are going to be particularly important, um, and knowing about them will be helpful for us. So let's talk about how to model each of these six elements. So when we look at the six major elements, we're going to show two different models. On the left, we're showing a uh, Bohr model. The Bohr model is going to show you the nucleus, which includes the protons and neutrons. And then it's going to show the various electron orbitals or electron shells where electrons are found. The Lewis dot structure is just going to use the symbol of the element along with the valence electrons, the electrons that are found in the outermost shell of that electron or the outermost orbital of the electron. So let's take a look at each of the six most common elements and talk about their properties and what we can learn just by looking at these models. So when we look at carbon, which is in our lower left, what we end up seeing here is that it says that there are six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. This immediately tells us a couple of pieces of information. One, it tells us the atomic number of carbon is six, because the atomic number is always the same as the number of protons. It also tells us the atomic mass, because the mass of an atom comes from the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So in this case, we have six pro protons, six neutrons, so the atomic mass of carbon is going to be 12. We also will see that there are six electrons, and the electrons in an uncharged atom are equal to the number of protons. We see two electrons in the first shell, and then we see four in the outermost shell, or valence electrons. Those valence electrons are the electrons that are going to be used to make bonds when carbon bonds with other things. All right, so let's go around the other uh, five elements real quick, and then we'll come back and talk about valence electrons um, and bonding. So below carbon, we see hydrogen, and you'll see just one dot in the middle. That represents the one proton that is found in hydrogen, and we see one electron. That's all there is in hydrogen. There's one proton and one electron, atomic mass of one, and atomic number of one. Looking at oxygen in the upper middle, we see that it's going to have eight protons, it has eight neutrons, and it has eight electrons, two in the first shell, and it has six in the next valence electron, uh, six in the next shell, or six valence electrons. Uh, and the atomic mass of this is going to be 16. Nitrogen, which is below um, oxygen in our uh, model here, we see that it's got seven protons and we got seven neutrons, so atomic mass of 14 and atomic number of seven. We see two electrons in that first shell because that's how many fit there. And then we have five electrons in the outermost shell or five valence electrons. So it's that N with five dots around it to represent it in the Lewis dot structure. Now, when we move over to sulfur and phosphorus, what we see is these are slightly larger, um, and so we have 16 protons, 16 neutrons in sulfur, atomic mass of 32. We see that there's two electrons in the first uh, electron shell, eight in the next shell, and then we see six in the next shell. So when we do our Lewis dot structure, um, it's very similar to oxygen. The only difference is that it has an S instead of an O as its atomic symbol, but there's the same number of valence electrons, so it is six dots around the outside. Phosphorus is going to have a very similar uh, Lewis dot structure to nitrogen, obviously with the exception of the symbol, um, but just like when we saw with sulfur, it's actually a much larger. So there's 15 protons, 16 neutrons, atomic mass of 31, and what we end up seeing is that's two electrons in the first shell, eight in the next shell, and five in that outermost shell. 
So I mentioned earlier the concept of valence electrons. One of the rules we tend to use with uh, these atoms, and it's not true of every atom on the periodic table, but for biology purposes, we like to see that there are eight electrons in the outermost shell. Actually, we like to see either eight or zero in most cases. Hydrogen will be an exception. I'll come to that in just a minute. So what that means is that if I am a carbon atom, I have four electrons in my outer shell. I need to either take four electrons from somewhere, give away four electrons, or somehow share electrons in order to get up to eight electrons. Similarly, if I look at oxygen, I have six. I need to take two more electrons, give away all six, or find some way to share so that I can get up to eight electrons. Nitrogen is, has got, you know, the ability to take up three more spots, sulfur two and phosphorus two. Hydrogen's a little different because you can only fit two electrons in its outermost shell. So it's got one electron and it's really only looking for one more. Okay. So this is going to help us as we move forward and we look into bonding and we look to find that octet rule. All right. So what I see here in the upper left hand corner is two Lewis dot structures, one of sodium and one of chlorine. And in this instance, you can see that sodium has one electron in its valence shell and chlorine has seven. So in this instance, what's gonna happen is the sodium is gonna give its one electron to chlorine. Sodium will become positively charged. It'll have a plus one charge. And the chlorine will become the chloride ion. It'll have a negative one charge. At this point, the sodium and the chloride are actually going to be attracted to one another, just like a magnet, where one's positive, one's negative, and they're going to draw each other to one another. This is called an ionic bond, um, and this is done by transferring an electron. So an ionic bond is going to be tr transferring an electron from one atom to another. We're going to contrast that with the idea of... Um, the formation of water, which is done through covalent bonding. So as we can look below, we see the um, Bohr models of oxygen and hydrogen. And in this in instance, the hydrogens are going to arrange themselves so that they are overlapping with the oxygen. Now, as a result of this, what's going to happen is they're going to share electrons. The hydrogen is going to share its one electron and it's going to share with one of the electrons from the oxygen. And we're going to do this twice. As a result, if you go around that oxygen in the right-hand side of this diagram, we're going to see that, in fact, we have eight electrons in the outermost shell. This is a perfect example of the octet rule. Hydrogen, as you recall, only has uh, one shell, and you can only put two electrons in that shell. So while it's not eight and doesn't meet octet rule, it does have a full valence shell, and so it's considered uh, chemically stable. So these two are examples of chemical bonds where atoms are held together and form um, specific bonded compounds. Now on the right hand side, in addition to showing the covalent bond that's between the hydrogen and oxygen, we also have something labeled that's called a hydrogen bond. Now hydrogen bonds are actually intermolecular forces. These are made, and we'll talk a lot more about these when we talk about water um, in one of the upcoming videos, but these are made when uh, the slightly positive charge that's on the hydrogen atom that's in a water molecule and the slightly negative oxygen that's in a water molecule that are on different molecules are attracted to each other. This is not as strong as the covalent bond and it's a intermolecular force, a force between two different molecules. Now this is important because it actually gives water a lot of its special properties so if you think about things like, uh, you know, it's the summer and you're going to dive into a pool and rather than doing nice dive form, you decide to do a giant belly flop, big body surface area. You got to break a whole lot of hydrogen bonds as you jump into that water. You're not going to break apart water molecules. You're not going to break apart um, the hydrogens and oxygens and release hydrogen oxygen gas into the atmosphere when you do a belly flop. But you will break the intermolecular forces that are holding water molecules uh, together as you push the water uh, molecules away from one another. So a little easier to break them, although you know your belly might be hurting if you're remembering a bad belly flop from some summer in the past. All right, so this leads us into the concept of an isotope and how it could be used in biology. And so when we talk about isotopes, isotopes are um, atoms that have different number of neutrons 
than other forms of that same element. So in our example over on the left hand side, what we see is we see carbon. And so we have carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. So the question is, how do these things differ from one another? As I mentioned before, the atomic number of carbon is based on the number of protons. So all carbons have six protons. And you can see this in these diagrams. But the number of neutrons can vary. So carbon-12 is going to have six neutrons, carbon-13 is going to have seven neutrons, and carbon-14 is going to have eight neutrons. Now you'll see that in terms of the relative abundance, most carbon is carbon-12. But there's a small number of carbon-13, a small, even smaller number of carbon-14. Carbon-14 happens to be radioactive carbon, and it will break down over time. Two quick notes, if you look on the periodic table and you look up the atomic mass of carbon, it's not exactly 12, and that's because we average these numbers together, uh, the total of carbon 12s, carbon 13s, and carbon 14s, to get the atomic mass that's put on the periodic table. When you're looking at a given atom, it's going to only have either a mass of 12, 13, or 14, but when we look at the um, periodic table, it shows a sum or a, it shows an average uh, mass for all the carbon atoms um, in the known world. Second, when we put eight neutrons in with those six protons, what we actually do is we make that slightly unstable. And so this is actually the radioactive isotope of carbon. Carbon-14 will break down. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if I have a kilogram of uh, carbon-14, in one half-life of carbon-14, which is just over 5,800 years, I will end up having half a kilogram of carbon-14. A half-life is the amount of time it takes for carbon to lose half of its radioactive isotopes. Now, this is not a linear relationship, so if we look on the upper right, what we find is that after one half-life, we'll have half the number of radioactive isotopes. After two half-lives, we have a quarter. After three, we have an eighth, and it's this asymptotic uh, decline or radioactive decay as we move um, as we move down from the parent atoms. The parent atoms being the radioactive isotope uh, that we started with. Now, why is this useful? Well, if I come across, say, a clay pot, and I want to know how old that clay pot is, and it's from you know human uh, a human settlement, I can test the amount of carbon fourteen in there versus the amount of carbon fourteen that would have been initially there. And as long as that um, that clay pot is you know from the last seventy five thousand hundred thousand years, I will be able to do a comparison of the amount of available carbon very easily and find out how old that specific radioisotope is. Now, what if I want to age something from the age of the dinosaurs? Well, I just pick a different radioactive isotope. Maybe I pick something like radioactive potassium, because for that, I need a half-life that's going to be able to um, project me back from 65 million to 250 million years old. I'm not going to be able to use something like carbon-14 that only has a half-life of, you know, 6,000 years, I will pick something with a longer half-life. But we can use this to date the age of fossils and the dates of rocks to figure out how old sediments are. This is obviously very useful, um, particularly in an evolutionary standpoint. Now, another example of how we can use radioactive isotopes in biology is as those uh, radioactive isotopes break down, they give off energy. And some of that energy is damaging to cells. So in the lower right here, what we have is an example of treating a cancer using radioactive isotopes. So in this particular instance, uh, a radiologist would set up, in this case, radioactive cobalt to release its radioactive gamma rays as it breaks down and focus it and target it at a specific tissue. This appears to be um, a brain tumor in this particular instance. And by focusing these gamma rays at the very pinpoint where the cancer cells are, we're going to try to destroy the cancerous cells um, and make it so that the cancer is, is destroyed um, as part of treatment. This is usually coupled with other forms of treatment as well, but this is an application of radioactive decay and the energy given off from radioactive decay in biology. All right, I hope that was helpful, and I will talk to everybody soon.